behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and Sanjoy Roy, we welcome you to a new season of JLF Brave New Worlds: Voices of Faith, a special series where we listen into discussions, analysis, and theories of the various philosophies that form the foundations on which most of our religious, spiritual, and mystic beliefs are based. This series is presented by the Kamini and Bindi Banga Family Trust. Our session today is Heaven on Earth, the universe of Kerala's Guru Vayu Temple, Pepita Sate, in conversation with Anupama Raju. Writer and photographer Pepita Sate's book, Heaven on Earth, the universe of Kerala's Guru Vayu Temple, is a vivid and detailed account of the almost standard sanctity that pervades Guru Vayu Temple its unique and elaborate traditions and the dominating presence of Guru Vayurappan, the Lord of Guru Vayur, Krishna. The book, which includes exquisite photographs, follows the temple's unceasing rituals, detailing its divine origins, its elaborate festivals, the complexity of the pujas, and the overwhelming devotion that centers on Lord Krishna. In conversation with poet and writer Anupama Raju. Pepita Sage has spent four decades documenting Kerala's Hindu rituals, taking seven years to chronicle the complexities of Guru Vayur Kerala's most famous temple and producing heaven on earth. She has now spent 15 years working on Thayam, living with the practitioners and their families, recording their lives and rituals. Anupama Raju is a poet, literary journalist and translator. She's the author of Nine, a book of poems, and her work has been widely anthologized and published. She was Charles Wallace Fellow at the University of Kent, Canterbury, and writer in residence at centers in the Monday Hotel, France. Please do ask questions and comment by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present Heaven on Earth, the universe of Kerala's Guru Bayur Temple. Pepita said in conversation with Anupam Maharaju, presented by the Kamini and Bindi Banga Family Trust. And this session, our podcast partner is Lachura. Over to you, Anupama. Thank you so much, Pratika. And uh, good evening and hello, everybody. What an extraordinary honor I have today to be in conversation with uh, this wonderful writer, photographer, and also in the context of this evening session, uh, I think a favorite child of Lord Guruvayu Rappan, I must say. Um, not only because this is such a beautiful book, which we are going to discuss tonight, but also because this has been a, the temple has been a great uh, part of my childhood, childhood memories. And I have several uh, Guruvayu Rappan devotees in my family. Therefore, Thank you, Pepita, and thank you to the JLF team for giving me this pleasure and joy. Um, hello, Pepita, again, and hello. <laughs> no real privilege to be talking to you tonight. Well, um, I'm all at myself. <laughs> Don't forget that. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, Pepita, let's. Uh, we will be discussing the book, of course, uh, this beautiful uh, record of of what goes on in one of the most extraordinary temples of the world, Guruvayu Rappan's temple and abode, heaven on earth, the universe of Kerala's Guruvayu temple. But before we get into the aspects of the book, I'd be uh, really delighted to know, on behalf of our audience today, tell us about your first encounter with Guruvayu temple. Well, it was a long time ago, I came to India for the first time in 1970, and I came back uh, two years later in 1972 uh, to go to Kerala for no other reason than I wanted to see elephants, which is a bit sort of, not very sort of highbrow, I suppose, but that meant I got taken to Guruaya Temple by some friends in Trichur, who uh, sort of parked me outside because of the restrictions that then existed about entering. And uh, I got then taken to where the elephants were kept. Now they're some distance from the temple because the numbers have increased. But in those days, there were only about were less than 16 of them. And there was Guru Keshavan. And the first photograph I ever took in Kerala was of him. 
And uh, I mean, I did do it and do have an elephant sort of obsession. But the point is, you don't have to know anything if you saw Guru Ayakeshava. You knew that he knew much more than you knew. He had that, he wasn't considered a beautiful animal per se, but he was considered to be of a more enormous presence, which is true. So that's what took me to Guru Ayo, but of course it took a little bit longer to pro uh, progress to where I was actually able to see more inside. Right. Uh, of course, you would be telling us later tonight about uh, your experiences with uh, Guru Ayo um, yes, yes. But also tell us, from that first encounter with the temple and the first visit to the temple, uh, how did it progress to you wanting to write the book? I know you always say that you consider it as a privilege. Um, I do. But, I mean, uh, I, I think if I lose that, if I lose that awareness, then something has slipped for me, or I slipped for in Guru itself. And actually, I did. Here, but one time as we got near to the Bhagwati's entrance, uh, she just turned around and said, Oh, come on. And so I entered Guru Aya Temple. And in those days, people forget now, I think, because you know it's it's so famous, it's so crowded. Well, not right now, of course, but it was. But in those days, which was 72, actually you could walk around the temple quite easy. There wasn't those huge crowds. So you you were able, I was able it, I, I, I don't think I actually ever thought about this when you mentioned it, but really it, it you just knew there was a kind of peace in there and something that made me feel I mean I hadn't examined it, but something that affected me very deeply. And uh, eventually I went, I went regularly with friends going there. And then one day I was in Trichur and I thought, I have to be big and bold for once in my life. And so I actually took a bus and went to Guru Ayo by myself and was able to sit there for a long time. And it, it just sort of took me over really. <laughs> Can you hear me, Pepita? Sound. I can't hear you, that's the There's no sound. Okay. Oh, it's back. Yes, <laughs> okay. Somebody's back anyway. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes, so yes. Um, uh, as, you, as you got to know Lord Guru Ayur better, and as you said, there was a certain sense of peace you felt. Today we are talking about faith. Um, I think something that's very relevant in in today's world. Yes, uh, Pepita, can you hear me? Can anybody else speak that would let us know if it's our soul? Yes. Okay. Okay, but I can't hear her questions. That's the problem. Right. Um, oh, now back again. Okay. Quicker okay. question. <laughs> okay. All right. Wonderful. Yes. This is just a little glitch there, but yes. I'm just going to repeat my question. It's good. I have been playing with this. Don't worry. I was <laughs> playing again. Yes. In the context of uh, of peace, you talked about peace, finding a sense of peace at the temple. Um, how would you correlate it with faith? which has become so relevant in today's world um, with the pandemic going on in everything. Yes. Um, I, I don't really know, quite frankly. Um, of course, I haven't been to the temple since it, the pandemic hit or not for almost nearly three years now, but yes. it's, 
it's a good question and I'm not quite sure how to answer it. Because I think, think particularly maybe in a walled temple, temp uh, walled temple, is there is that sense of enclosure. And therefore, um, I think, I, I tell you, one of the uh, uh, Odigans who became the Meshandi, the chief priest of the temple, I mean, he, he, he otherwise uh, performed rituals on a daily basis. But of course, once they go in and become the head priest, they are not allowed out for the entire six months that they're there. And I asked him afterwards, what was the difference? And he said, well, as the Mishandi, because he couldn't go out, he said, I am fully with the Lord all the time. Whereas if I go out, uh, you know, there are domestic, somebody's asking me a question that I have to deal with. But he said, I could be fully with the Lord. And I think in a way that that is probably so. I mean, I spent at one stretch. I mean, I didn't spend the night in the temple, but I was up until one o'clock when just when the Krishna Atam ended and then I would go and then come back very early in the morning. So near enough. And I think after something like six or seven weeks of that, I had to go back to Trichur where I ostensibly lived. And coming out of the temple was really horrible. Outside, you know, there was noise and the usual sort of uh, goings on of a busy place. And I, I couldn't believe the difference of having been inside. I mean, so for what it can be like for somebody who's really inside and really attending to the Lord on a daily basis for six months, it must be almost traumatic coming out. It's like the reverse of a prison in a way. It's uh, mm. The prison is a welcoming, nurturing uh, space and outside is not. It's um, very strange. But it, that, that the end of my six weeks or whatever it was, I can't remember. I, I really, I, I just wanted to turn around. I, did, I thought I was never reached the bus stop, actually. I'd better turn around and go back inside. Right. And I suppose a sort of um, conscious or unconscious of that, uh, of that feeling affects people that go, go in there. So, yes, it's even more welcoming to them now, particularly when now the numbers that they allow in on a daily basis is so small. So, um, yeah. Yes. So that takes me to the next question. You, you talked about this, this um, a certain atmosphere, which is, which is completely, um, you know, arresting and yes. all-consuming. Um, the... the even otherwise, those who are familiar with Kerala's temples would notice that they are very distinct from yes. other temples very. In, in form, in rites, in every sense. Uh, there, is a certain, there is a certain fragrance, there is a certain kind of architecture, the lamps, yeah. the dim lights, the, the smell of the fragrance of sandalwood. Um, I remember, and the smell of butter. I remember all these and elephants. <laughs> yes. oh, elephants. <laughs> they smell yes. good. Yes. And absolutely. Uh, I mean, all of them combining to kind of take you on this wonderful yeah. journey. So amidst all this, you also see demonstrations of faith and devotion. Yes. Uh, you, see, you see crowds thronging the temple. They are doing the Shayana Pradesham. And they yes. are... Oh, I know there was one... Uh, some festival where they were sort of all backed up those people and there was sort of something like nine of them trying to turn a corner and go through a crowd oh. almost impossible to and then were they they also stopped outside the Kodimaram of course and it's it's um yes it's it's even in even in a crowd it's some somehow even when you're pushing and being pushed of course to get into the Nalambalam there is still that sense of being completely isolated. It's just you and Guru Ayurapa. It's It's really weird. And actually, I think the other thing about Guru Ayur, you mentioned about the differences, architectural and everything, between Kerala's temples and elsewhere. And that, that, of course, is absolutely true. At the same time, actually, in many ways, because so much of this Kerala, uh, Guru Ayur was destroyed by fire, in um, 1970, all that survived yes. were the outside walls, the Kutambalam and the Sanctum. So actually, mm -hmm. at one time, it was a very ugly building. And now they're sort of 
caralizing it a bit, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but what it somehow proves is that whatever is in that place is not affected by bad architecture. You know, the, right. there is that, that, yeah. that absolutely never budged, never budged. And so, I mean, you know, even if, you know, uh, tourists were allowed in and all that kind of thing, I think they would probably be, well, less so now, but quite disappointed about what's inside because it's, it's intangible is what is drawing them. And that intangibleness remains. Wonderful. So when you, when you are in the act of photographing this uh, intangibility, so to speak, yeah. um, what, is it that, uh, what is it that you experience when you're trying to capture these moments of devotion and faith? What um, have you experienced? Well, the first of all, let me tell you, when I, it took me something like uh, two or three, a month or so to actually summon up the courage to pick up the camera. And I just sort of kept sitting there and thinking, I can't do it. And maybe I'll just go do some research or something. And then one day I thought I'll walk around the temple and I walked around three times. And on the third round, I looked towards somebody who was one of the temple people, but I didn't know him then, of course. And he gave the most wonderful smile and said, is there anything I can do to help you? And I thought, I'm not alone in here. And it's, it, 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 because actually, how do you set about photographing it and everything? And after I calmed and realized that other people weren't bothered, I mean, I still think that's bizarre, actually, that, you know, identifiably foreign with two cameras. What's it doing here? Okay. But it never, never, never bothered anybody. I mean, occasionally, sorry. Right. They were always from outside, not non Carolite, my, my mm. And um, I just sort of settled into it. And then you start to hone in on what is actually going on. You, you also get, and I have to say, in my case at least, it get to, you have to know what is happening, what the ritual is, when it will happen. And then you start sort of uh, thinking, well, if they do this and that. So you're prepared for what is. And I had a kind of fascination by the isolated uh, moment and also when people are so uh, consumed or wrapped up in their devotion they're really not they've lost all sense of anybody being anywhere near them right and i mean yes. I could describe it but th there was i i found there was also a place that you could go to up upstairs and look down mm. over the, mm. the over the corner and they it was a festival procession coming along so it was a lot of uh, uh, people and musicians and everything and the, the procession had stopped and one man went and prostrated before the elephant and grind up and I mean just a lone figure surrounded by all this uh, the majesty of Guruaya putting on its show you know because he was making his um, feelings known to the Lord and uh, it was between right. the, the two of them regardless of all these other people and you yes. I used to be very touched by that capacity to lose yourself in a place with that number of crowds and everything and yeah. I thought if I can just catch something of that um, mm. so I, I of course I never had a plan because I've never had a plan but um you, you are gradually sinking, and you, I also, in the end, it helps when the temple people get to know you, and um, uh, because they they would alert me to things that would, would happen. And uh, well, uh, one time, the, with the, uh, ten times a year, they use a special uh, column on the elephant, which is no, known as the gold one, because every all the things on it are in gold. And of course, you can't stand directly in front of the procession because uh, there's the elephant. And then there are 12 people, well, six, 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 six in a row, it's both side. And in front of them are the chenda players. So to get a picture straight on is next to impossible. So I used to think, but if only I stood near the side, little back, and they, and they turned that, I would get full on to that. But you, there was no way of doing it because they were going forward. But I happened to speak 
later that morning to one of the priests and everything about the fact of this. And he, he didn't say very much. But the next morning when I was standing, just in case by accident they turned it my way, I saw very slowly it was going sort of like this. So there was right. absolutely, and then without anything being said, it went straight back again. Because uh, they, he'd gone and told the people on the elephant, if she's <laughs> there, then, but don't, don't let it be so obvious that somebody asks afterwards, what are they doing? <laughs> so I oh, was little Gurairapan's little helpers, as I used to call them. But uh, oh, so it was a yeah. lot of that took place, actually. The, one, and once they, the, they, they realized what I was doing and why I was doing it, there was tremendous um, support for helping me and letting me know um, when something was to be seen or it was about to happen and where they felt might be a good place. I mean, do you right. want me to go on a bit or? Oh, uh, that was while you were talking about devotees and the little help that you got from, from others. There was this one incident that, um, that's this one know. incident that comes to my mind in the book. Yeah. where um, I think one of the women devotees wanted you to do an offering on her behalf. And then yes, you yes. asked her, yes. 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 Would, you, would you please tell that story? Yes. Now, this was a woman who lived in Trichur, like I pretended I did. And uh, one day she said, Am I, are you going to the temple today? And I said, yes. And she said, uh, okay. And she thought of coming to, and then she said, no. She said, well, will, will you actually do something for me in the temple? I said, yes, of course, if I can. She said, will you make an offering uh, for me and everything? Yes, I said, ask for the nakshatram and all those sort of things. I said, but um, you go to the temple every week anyway. So why, why sort of do you need me to do it? She said, well, everybody knows you're Gurairapan's pet. <laughs> So, I mean, I, it, I mean, it is, I think it's a real example of how amazingly open actually India is in these circumstances by all the sort of laws and everything I shouldn't have been in there. But once I was in there, nobody was, of, nobody, I was of no interest to anybody except the people, you know, that I was in. <laughs> well, and to Lord Guru Yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. 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 So, um, coming to all the myths that surround the origin and the history of the temple, yeah. there are so many legends. Yes. Um, is, there, is there one story that, that is a favorite of yours? Or if somebody were to ask you, what is the beginning of the temple? Which one would you pick? Um, well, actually... I like it that when uh, Krishna is supposed to come, uh, the idol was brought there after the Dwaraka submersion or whatever it was. And he left instructions that the idol was to go to the most sacred place in the world. And mm. so they wandered around, of course, Guru and Vayu, as it happened. And uh, they reached Trichur, the Vatikanathan temple, and Parashurama was there, and he said, I'll take you to the place. And he took them to, to Guruvayur. Now, of course, in those days, first of all, there was nothing there because all the, the, the land was saline because it's that near the sea and everything. Um, and uh, Shiva and Parvati were meditating under the lake or whatever they called it then. And he said, this is the most, and they explained that there was a shrine for the Bhagavati. So there was some confusion. If Bhagavati was there, then where, where was Gurairapan to go? Anyway, they went to that shrine and the Bhagavati got up and said, oh, I've been waiting for you and now this place is yours um, and I will move to the left. So the Bhagavati shrine is there. And she said, but once a year, I want the Lord's pujas done in front of me. And that's mm. what, one of the days, I think it's the second from the last day of the uh, Utsavam. Uh, they yes. enclose the whole area and the puja is done for right up and there. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. And I've also, I've also noticed, I mean, I'm sure everybody has, that Lord Gurvayurapan has a very distinct appearance, very unique. Yes. Um, uh, so when we talk about the temple, it's, 
it's unavoidable but to talk about the temple art and the murals yes. inside the temple that depict him. Yes. Um, so could you tell us a bit about his appearance and how he looks so different from his various other, you know, incarnations? That, I mean, do you mean as seen in the sanctum? Um, just Lord Gurayurakun, the, you know, uh, yes. like in the sanctum, I don't have much of a memory because the crowd is so much. Yes, you just also, what, you know, it's, um, it's black stone and I gave up fairly right. early on trying to discover what stone it was. They just... But and also it's that there is there are feelings there that you know matter what that that idol will remain in worship. But I, I mean I mean just the ah they, ah that that yes that that picture that uh, was done by uh, Mamio Krishnan Kuti, Krishnan right. Kuti I think, and that is I think more an image of maybe what how he was seen then because now it, it's 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 very. And in fact, that um, painting, which is about the size of a small child, it's, 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 uh, uh, mm -hmm. I found in the mural painting institute in a corner, and it was covered in cobwebs and everything. And I berated somebody who was actually my friend in, in charge of the uh, mural institute, and I said, this is a masterpiece. And he had actually studied under this man too. And they brought it out and cleaned it. And it, I mean, it is simply magnificent because he, the man, you know, did all the mantras and the, the whole uh, approach to making, uh, do, doing the, uh, the draw painting uh, before he ever painted it. And it, it's transparent in that. It is so beautiful. It really is. And when you see now what I call the Davison's official image of Gurairapan, it's it, it, it's chalk and cheese. It's very very different, and it the, the, mm. that I because for the uh, sort of image of the Lord uh, art uh, chapter, I can't remember what it was actually called. But you know there were no photographs. Right? That way, that way, yes. no way I could provide any photographs. But I I so actually it was lucky that I found that uh, painting. So uh, that's why I photographed it, even just his lips. You know. I think I think that's in the book, yes. But because everything yes. had this touch of sort of um, luminous uh, sanctity about it, mm. because it it, it, oh, it it's come from the man, it's come from the man, the painter, and uh, so yes, I'm surprised that uh, picture's not reproduced more actually because it's really stunning. Right. And still in the Mural Institute, if anybody goes there. But in given pride of place now. Lovely. Um, now, of course, talking about the great Gurayur Keshavan. So for the for the sake of the audience, you know, the temple elephants in Kerala are are very dear to the people. They're they're loved by people and they're revered. And Gurayur Keshavan is probably the most iconic of them all. Yeah, oh definitely. And Pepita, what has been your experience? Tell us about Keshavan. Well, uh, first of all, um, it was the uh, Guruvar Keshavan was the first uh, the, the photograph I took of him. Was the first yes. photograph I took in Kerala, which is probably the most suspicious thing that could have happened to me. And I was I have no clue who it was, but he, at those days there were very few elephants, and they were kept quite near the temple. So I went there and the six seven eight nine elephants actually they they were being washed and there was just something about him uh that uh you knew and it was fantastic and um well if I, the easiest way i can explain this is to tell you about how he died you're prepared for it because every the one of the ways that they they select the elephant that is going to carry the lord for the um 10 days of the festival and yes. um he, he he can't go out of the temple or anything so it has to be a healthy animal obviously and he has to win the race and for years he won it very easily so it was no argument and then he got older and frailer and one year he lost the race and uh 
they immediately gave orders that the, uh, the elephant that won, which was Padma, no, I know it wasn't Padma, that to be taken, immediately be taken out of the temple in case Guru Vakesh uh, sort of threw a fit. And then they had a quick uh, discussion and they decided that they told Guru Vakesh, okay, you can carry him this year, but next year you better win the race. So same thing happened the following year. So of course, then they changed the rule book and said you can carry him until you can't carry him and there was the last time he came into the temple they knew he was i mean it was a tremendous risk that they were taking actually because you know death in the temple at a time like this a sacred moment it's really yes. bad news and he came in and you, during the time of the festival when you can't get a, another ant in there it's so crowded and people automatically pushed back to give him the space. And he knelt and it was like, like a sort of 10 story building trying to somehow rise and he was, and he did all the rituals very slow. He, he knew all the rituals anyway. And on the third round, he went down and then by himself, he walked out of the temple, turned right and walked down to where they were kept then and lay down Fate, oh, it was Egadashi, that's right. He lay down and the, the actual the ultimate um, indication of a, the elephant's respect is he dug his right tusk into the ground and extended his trunk directly towards the, if you could go straight through the wall, directly towards where Gurayatakan's shrine was, waited till the most sacred moment of the year on Egadashi and left his body. I yeah I mean I when I read the story it gave me goosebumps there were several such moments in the book yeah. and one this one is one such story and the man who made it his um, his life to provide the uh, um, food for the elephants he knew every one and butter tree in Kerala and people willingly gave it and everything and the only thing people ever wanted from me in uh, Gruyere was that photograph. I, yes. I, I don't know how many. I, I, I actually, I gave it to one of the studios and said, you know, when you're running out, just put some more sort of thing. And one of the ones I wanted to, was this man to get a copy of it. So I, I had it framed and everything. And he, went to, he was asked to come to somewhere and I went there too and I gave it to him. And he sat there talking and, and it's supposing this is Guru Vakesha. He just ran his fingers round and round and round the outline of his body. And then he finally said, he was my brother. Oh. He was my brother. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very moving tale. And I'm just, I was just trying to see if I can find that rough to yes. kind of show it to our viewers. Yes. But, um, but I think these are, this is just one reason why Urvayu Temple is... Yes, it is different. It is different. It, it, yes, all Kerala temples are wonderful, but uh, Guruvayur has a has a uniqueness about it. Yes, you found it. I can't, oh, even, I'm, I'm I can't even say what page it is. I should know it now by now. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll find it soon. Okay. In the meantime, in a few minutes, we'll be hearing from our audience as well. Okay. But um, I'm I'm thinking of the time that I used to be taken to the temple you know yeah. i grew up i grew up outside kerala so any any trip to Gurvayu was was always something that was extraordinary it was very yeah. special yeah. i didn't understand i didn't quite understand what was going on but uh, yeah. some of these senses were extraordinary and i have a distinct memory of it uh, but you always see some very sometimes even extreme demonstrations of, of faith, of people giving up everything for the Lord. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm sure you've noticed that. Too. Well, the small, small thing, but it was so wonderful. And one day in the, it was, wasn't a very crowded day or anything. And I saw a young guy, maybe 20, 22 or something, who was sweeping. And I suddenly realized I knew him. Uh, he came from somewhere called Radhakan Cherry, which was quite near Budoyo. And I went and said, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, sort of with great, but great, but not, you know, overt pride, I sweep for the Lord. 
Oh, he was a sweeper in the temple. You know, right. when you have that sort of um, yes. um, beauty in you, then uh, you know it's it's a it's a privilege and it's, it's a right, right of the yeah, Lord. Absolutely, it's, you know, right, some, at the beginning you said that I that you, if that's what was such a privilege to go. Yes. How how uh, um, close everybody was to Gurai. We know nobody's frightened of Gurai. I mean, yeah. the Thayim, which is what I've been doing recently. The, the, most and many of those deities are really quite scary. But you know, you okay, could. Okay, so I find them. Um, I mean, I found. Yes. I found Guru <laughs> Yes. Yes. It's a beautiful <laughs> photograph, Pepita. Thank you so much for this gift. Well, because anybody who anybody who cares who loves uh, cares for elephants and who loves elephants would cherish this. And this is, of course, the gentleman you were talking about. Oh, that's 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 him. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah, he was, was he was very frail then, but, uh, yes. and he also when he had finished touching the photograph, uh, he gave it back to me. He hadn't realized he'd been given it. So when I gave it back, I said, "No, it's for you." Tears started rolling down his face. Right. Yes. So very sweet. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. So um, once once this pandemic is over and once we are all able to move about, uh, I'm sure you would be going back to the temple. Would this you is... be Would you be photographing more? No, I, I, I went at the beginning, uh, they, they, they were some just said you can do it. And then eventually I got a treasured possession, which was a, you know, identity thing, which said Papita, permitted photographer. <laughs> so because oh, oh. otherwise they were, you know, it's and people were always coming up to me and saying, when does this start and where shall I go for this? And where are the offerings and how can I get by us? <laughs> Things like that, because I, it was a temple uh, thing. But so no, um, I, I uh, that was I, I I had made my offering to Gurayapan, and there's no real point I don't think in doing any more. So I started by going to the temple, and I want to end by going to the temple. You know, it's it's complete. I, think. I mean, you can always go on, of course. But <laughs> yes, I mean when when I was. When, when I heard about this session, the first thought that occurred to me is, oh, I haven't been to Gurdwaya in such a long time. I hope, I hope I get an opportunity to go yeah, there someday. I know, I know, yes. yes. Anyway. So uh, I think it's a safe assumption that uh, it, it is, would it be a safe assumption to say that uh, you made Trishur your home because of Lord Gurdwaya <laughs> Yes, I think so. I mean, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we've started receiving questions from the audience, which is wonderful. So I'm just going to ask you the first question. Uh, Ridhima uh, wants to know what makes the Guruvayu Temple unique. Tell us more about the rituals performed at the temple. Well, actually, all, all these big temples have somewhat similar uh, rituals but it's of course how the individual temple puts it into practice and from early I mean the temple actually opens at three o'clock in the morning and the Mishandi is already dealing with uh, uh, the previous night's garlands and everything but he has to be he actually enters the temple at 1 30 in the morning after his bath in the what was then must be a very cold tank and things are just rolling on throughout the day. Three times a day, the Lord is taken around the, um, out of the outer compound on an elephant, Shiveli, to see how everybody is doing. And otherwise, you know, deeper Adana, and then at night, there is the um, night Vilaka when it's, he's taken around with... Uh, these bundams and lights and everything. So there's all, that is an ongoing, repeating um, performance, if you like. But otherwise, of course, there will be special things at special times and how they decorate the temple there and how they arrange it. And the, the, then there's the festival and the Kalashim. And it, it's an ongoing... Um, I mean, the, the, the last night of the 
uh, Utsavam, uh, is really remarkable because again you can't get anything in the temple but actually it ends with the lord on Guraipan, on the on the elephant running around the temple and the place is so crowded at that stage that they have to clear a space let the elephant run let the people behind the elephant come up close to the back of him to free a space for the another but they just the concept of that's how you uh, take the, as as the festival is ending that is what you do with with Gurai, when you take him around and also the last two days of the festival itself is when he goes out of the temple because he is the lord of Guruel, not just Guruel temple so he goes out and people dress in all their best to show that, that they're okay that they're happy he you know he's looking after them well and all the way along people uh, have lit and uh, lots of lamps and lots of growing up on idols outside shops and everything that you can think of and it's a time of immense joy and fantastic gender playing going with it i mean it takes all night for it to, to go around and uh, it it is that ongoing repeating changing it's different it's the same but it gives the whole temple i think a certain certainty certainty that you know whatever happens gurayapan is not going anywhere except that in fact it is everywhere so you know yes, um, yes. something like that <laughs> oh that's that's great there are a couple of questions on the um, but um no, I, well, it's, yes, as you wish. But I said, as but you But there wish. is a question also. Yes, we, I mean, we will go into that okay. if we have time. But we have a question from Vidya, who would like to know about the significance of the Kutambalam of the temple. The Kutambalam is uh, a traditional uh, Kerala building, and a lot of big temples used to have them, where Kudiyatam or small, small rituals are conducted. Kudiyatam is done in Guruayo twice a year, um, twice a year, maybe more often. And it's it's an enclosed small space. And luckily when the fire destroyed Kerala, destroyed the, the temple, uh, the Kutambalam survived, which is a miracle because it's wood. Uh, the, the, the problem when there is fires in Kerala's temples, it's wood, so they tend to burn badly. Um, so it's used for small performances. Yes, and I believe it has just been fully renovated because there was a tendency at one time to use right. it as a storeroom. <laughs> but, right. uh, and in Gurvayur, in, in the temple, you still have uh, Krishnatam being performed. Yes, Krishna, but that's that's um, that's in the outer. Uh, okay, uh, not in the Kutambala. No, no, it, it's too big. It, you, okay. it's, a, it's a small scale thing. The, the, right. Right. So, yes, Krishnatam is the temple's. Actually, the, the thing about Krishnatam is it was under the uh, Zamarin, Zamarin of Calicut. It was done because yeah. they, the, the original man who'd written it, it was from the uh, Zamarin's family. And uh, when the breakup of the system, uh, they couldn't afford to support it anymore. So as the Zamarin of Calicut is one of the permanent trustees of the temple, he asked Guru Vaya to take it over. And it seems amazing now, but there were huge protests against it because actually mm. the temple itself was not wealthy in those days, not like it is. It's been mm. a very recent explosion. And people felt that if money was spent on, you know, operate, uh, man maintaining the Kushnatum true, the rituals would suffer. But the temple, always a law unto itself, uh, went ahead. And of course, now. Right. So we have about, I think, a couple of minutes left. Would you like to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, because we do have questions from uh, Nadine on, um, I mean, sorry, on uh, about from Shashwati and Nandini. Uh, for instance, Shashwati says, Bayam is a folk ritual. Could you give us some historical background on this dance form? It's, it's each. Well, yeah. Yeah. So. No, no I, I would like to say um, that it's not a dance form. It is not a dance form. It is a ritual. Instead of going, what you do in Guruayo, you go into Guruayo and you pray before the Lord's idol. 
in Krishna, in um, Bayam, the idol is yeah. walking around and you can interact with the deity. That is the major difference. Mm -hmm. but otherwise, the, in fact, when I had a long session with one of the Dayakarans about this, he said he used Guru Ayur as an example, saying you go into Guru Ayur, but in fact, the, the deity that I carry comes to me. I mean, right. He didn't put it as bluntly as that, but that, in effect, the, the deity is, is walking around and has come down from heaven. And that is why the deity, the deity is called down from heaven and why the deity dances, because he or she is so pleased to be with his or her uh, uh, devotees. It's a, it's a sign of uh, their joy at being with their devotees. That's well, that's an instance. It's, it's a thousand years or whatever. You know, according to the Thayim people, it came with the uh, first yuga. So uh, take your choice, really. Right. So there, there, there is another instance of uh, heaven on earth. Um, just as we have, we have the, the temple of uh, Lord Guru Ayurvedan. Um And I hope everybody gets an opportunity to go and to experience it for themselves. Yes. Um, I think we are running out of time. Yes. So yeah. I, I just got the cue. <laughs> thank you so much, Papita. It's been a pleasure. Well, and thank you. Uh, thank you to the Depor team. Absolutely. It's been a delight. Well, thank, thank you, you. everybody. That Over to you, is possible. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pepita and Anupama for that fascinating discussion. And we hope we all get to go to the Guru, Guru Vayu Temple one day. Yes. Thank you to the Kamini and Vindi Banga Family Trust for supporting this series. And thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. We look forward to seeing you on Friday, the 27th of Arsi Kitchen and Haita Dhundi in conversation with Roj Roshni Bajaj Sangvi at JLF First Edition at 7 p.m. IST and at Jaipur Literature Festival online at 8.30 p.m. IST. We have Regrets None, Dolly Thakur and Argya Lahiri in conversation with Sanjoy Roy. We hope to see you then. Good night and take care. Thank you.